um, introduction. Is there any announcement for this week's uh, colloquium? Yes, Mighty. So, I think there is a Genetic Astronomy Club meeting at Wilmington by the two. Um, and then we have a Thank you, Mikey. Any other announcements? No? All good. Dr. Fletcher. I will be appearing, well, weather permitting, and it's supposed to rain on Saturday, but I will be appearing as, as a spirit walk at the uh, Temple Hill Cemetery, and I will represent the spirit of um, Guy Bailey, who, who Bailey Hall was named after. So if you'd like to come and hear about some of the people who were buried in our cemetery in Geneseo, <laughs> that I think it's like six to eight on Saturday night. Sure. Right. Any other announcements? Okay, so we're gonna move on to the piece of resistance of our talk today. So we have a distinguished guest from Space Telescope Science Institute. For those who don't know that institute, this is the science space of operation for the James Webb Space Telescope. It's about to be launched on uh, December 18th. That's the plan, the current plan, if I understand it correctly. Right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and it is also the base of operation for the, hot, the current Hubble Space Telescope. So this is a great space, place to be to do astronomy. Uh, Lou got his PhD in astronomy at University of Michigan in 2003. Uh, he's been doing a lot of things since, so I'm going to skip some steps. But basically, he is uh, currently the deputy head for the instrument division at the Space Telescope Science Institute. So this is a very important uh, 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 position, especially right now with all of these new instruments going on and being built and being launched very soon. He is, uh, scientifically speaking, he is very interested in supernovae, cosmology, dark energy. He's going to talk about that today in greater detail. And something also that I really appreciate from uh, Lou is that he uh, has been involved a lot in diversity initiatives. For instance, he has uh, been um, in many diversity committees at the Space Telescope itself. He is a former chair of the Committee of Studies of Minorities in Astronomy at the WAS. He was also, he is a former chair at the uh, um, American Physics Society Committee on Minorities. And he's been a member of the National Society of Black Physicists since 1992. So he's very, very dedicated in, uh, to many causes, astronomy and more. Uh, personally, I met Lou at the Space Telescope when I was a uh, uh, postdoc there. Uh, he was a good friend, I think, with my uh, office mate, Swara. And every time he entered the room, what I remember from uh, Lou is that he was warming up that room. Somehow he had this presence of warming up the room. He is very smart, he is very committed, and he's also a very great speaker. So I'm going to shut up and let him speak. <laughs> And thank you so very much for that very kind introduction. <laughs> and I'll try to keep this as, as bright and lively as I can. Uh, please let me know if I can't be heard or if there's a problem with the communication in any way, but I will push on. So when I typically give these talks, I usually start off with some recent supernova discovery that has caught my eye or ha that I've been a, a part of that uh, you know really tells us something fundamental about supernovae or super exciting about super, uh, supernovae in general. This one floated across my desk in just the last few days, but it's a discovery from earlier this year. It's the very first discovery of what we call the electron capture supernova uh, by Hiramatsu et al. Um, at the Los Cumbres Observatory. The supernova can be seen as that big bright uh, star in the in the center right hand side of the image, uh, superimposed on a nearby galaxy, uh, 2146. What's interesting about this supernova is not that it's like the very first one that has ever been detected. It's the first one that's been confirmed 
as a electron capture supernova. And uh, I'll get more into a little bit more into this mechanism uh, in the next slide. But in essence, this is a kind of a different type of core collapse event where the electron pressure inside the star or the, the, the pressure from inside the star from electrons itself uh, gets deteriorated from uh, the capture of these electrons by, um, let's see if I can advance the slide, I'm having a little trouble here, by neon within uh, the center of this, uh, the star. Uh, I found this really funny, uh, or it's really interesting as you look at, say it another different way, uh, a very interesting cartoon of what's happening where this neon within the star just gobbling up all the electrons around it, removing that electron pressure and eventually leading to a different type of uh, core collapse event. It's the very first confirmed of its type and it actually may go a long way to explaining events like the, the crab uh, supernova and uh, 1054, which you know we only see its remnant now, but uh, we believe could have been uh, one of the electron capture supernovae. So before I start into this, we should probably start on the same basis. What is a supernova? Uh, all stars more or less live and die uh, in a very similar way. They have this stellar evolution, which only for the most part, depends on mass. Uh, the, the more massive stars to the upper part and left-hand side of this uh, diagram eventually become supernovae of one type or another, uh, undergoing core collapses, uh, uh, very typical core collapses where they just run out of fuel to uh, produce the light which supports the outer layers of the star and it eventually collapses in on itself in a very kinematic way uh, starts uh, burning to very heavy elements, and those heavy elements, uh, even though they're exo, they're not uh, exothermic; they're endothermic, uh, so they can't produce any more energy. And you know, the whole the whole thing collapses really rapidly to a, uh, to form a really really uh, rigid core. And that rigid core uh, starts this shock that propagates back through the super through the star itself in a uh, supersonic. Uh, way, which is what we call an, an explosion, or as we see it, a supernova. This is true for almost every star, you know, heavier than uh, uh, only about eight solar masses. Those below that uh, die a very different way, typically. They typically just fizzle out into planetary nebulae and eventually into white dwarfs, with the exception of a few, which get this reprieve. They're able to somehow steal material from some nearby star, presumably, and that stealing of material rekindles this process uh, where eventually you get a thermonuclear, uh, thermonuclear detonation of the core, which propagates all throughout the rest of the white dwarf and uh, dissipates it uh, 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 supersonically. So you get this explosion that we see as thermonuclear supernovae or white dwarf supernovae, uh, which have of course been um, all the rage over most of my uh, scientific career for one very specific part, for one specific uh, way uh, or reason I should say. And that is that they actually explode almost homogeneously. If you were to look at the light curve of a type 1a supernova, you would see that it rises to a maximum and declines in a very, very similar way. There's very little dispersion uh, in that rise and decline rate. Uh, there seems to be a slight uh, dispersion on the order of maybe one or two magnitudes, but that also seems to correlate with the width of the light curve. So the, the brighter events last a little longer than uh, the, the fainter ones. If you were to just empirically correct this, uh, basically raising the brightness uh, in, uh, in a way that corresponds with the width, you can arrive at a very precise measure of the brightness of all of type 1a supernovae. This is important. It's like the holy grail of uh, cosmological uh, studies. It allows us to determine distance only via the inverse square law. You know how bright they are intrinsically? 
after you do a little correction. You compare that to how bright they appear, you know it's distance. If we do uh, inverse square law, that distance plays out cosmolo cosmologically by looking at redshift, uh, let me say that way, plays out with respect to redshift with the understanding of certain cosmological terms. So if you know uh, a bit about uh, the distance, you can actually probe these cosmological terms, how, how much curvature there is in the universe, how much matter there is, whether or not that be ordinary or dark. And of course, if there's some hidden component, like how much dark energy there is, you can probe that too. So that sets up the experiment that we've been embarking on for well over 25 years, trying to uh, plot out the trajectory of the universe by placing our, our these type 1a supernovae on a diagram, which just says how, you know, how fast the universe is moving with respect to how far away they are. And from that, we can tell what the history of the expansion rate of the universe has been, whether or not it's been decelerating as we expected to do, to do 25 years ago, or even coasting, or maybe even doing something funny. So we, when I joined Space Telescope, around the same time Anne did, we, I was uh, heavily involved in this campaign to use the telescope in a very novel way. We'll map out a very large region, for large at its time, uh, to uh, of uh, 150 square arc minutes in two fields. Actually, it turns out the two fields combined are 300 square arc minutes. Mapping these out by basically tiling pointings with Hubble, with Hubble, doing them very, very deeply, with the primary goal of trying to understand how galaxies evolve. But if we separate those observations into uh, 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 a couple of spaced out cadences, with you know, uh, over uh, over over some time scale, we can actually use these to find supernovae as well. In the course of that project, we found, I don't know, uh, let's see, the first, I think we found a total of about 127 supernovae, about 55 of which we were able to put on a Hubble diagram. Uh, we were able to also repeat that, program, that project again with a, a project that began sometime in the mid 2010s, actually the early 2010s. Um, again, looking at those same two fields in the upper part of the diagram, with now two flanking fields addition, added in addition, and then three other really interesting uh, uh, cosmological fields to, to better understand the evolution of galaxies, but also find super. These efforts allowed us to paint out the history of expansion to even larger distances than have been uh, done prior to it. And what we found is the history of expansion in the universe is quite complicated. It's not slowing down under its own weight as we would have expected back in, uh, 20, back in 1998. Instead, it has recently been accelerating in its expansion, getting faster, further apart faster than you would expect from uh, a coasting universe. What's even more interesting is if you look even further back, that acceleration gives way to deceleration. The universe was slowing down at some point in the existing past. This is all actually expected uh, in a cosmology, in a universe that is filled with something that we call cosmological constant, which we now identify uh, as responsible for dark energy. But that was a huge discovery at its time, so huge, in fact, that they gave my postdoctoral advisor an award. Uh, it, the Nobel Prize in 2011, he sh shared it uh, with uh, two other uh, big contributors to the discovery of dark energy. I got a firm handshake and a nice pat on the back, but I'm really happy with what I got. Uh, it was a great time. We, we uh, were able to show that the universe is indeed accelerating and that there's really great new mysteries out there. We're now at a point where we're just trying to refine what it is that dark energy is. Uh, as I alluded to a little earlier, our strongest candidate at the moment seems to be a cosmological constant, a uh, sort of a minimum energy that's tied to the vacuum of space. 
Um, we measured uh, the property by which we use to measure this cosmological constant or dark energy in general is its equation of state or the ratio of pressure to density. We compare that to uh, the value of, let's say, uh, the, uh, the amount of dark matter there is. And in comparing and in, in combining that with other experiments, which are much more sensitive to the curvature of space like CMB, or it's the amount of matter there is, uh, dark matter there is in the universe, like the baryon acoustic oscillations, we can jointly arrive at a bullseye diagram, which you see on the left, which sort of indicates where our best uh, uh, measure of uh, dark energy is. And the cosmological constant is that pinpoint in the center of that diagram. Uh, our whole plan is to zero in on that, uh, on that pinpoint as best we can uh, with further uh, investigations like uh, having better baryon acoustic oscillation uh, experiments, finding more and more supernovae uh, through uh, uh, projects which I'll begin to describe in just a little bit, and through trying to refine our understanding of what type 1a supernovae truly uh, uh, originate from. And that's where this talk actually really kicks off. So, you may, as astronomy students, have uh, some picture of what you think makes uh, a type 1a. It's uh, derived, as I so, uh, talked about in the first two slides, from a white dwarf star that, as I uh, alluded to, has a reprieve. It steals some material from some nearby star until it explodes uh, thermonuclearly. Generally, we think of that, we've thought of that uh, nearby star as like a red giant star, uh, which is you know, very close in stellar evolution to the white dwarf, just a little bit slower than uh, the, the progenitor for the white dwarf. But it is so nearby that it's able to steal material well, uh, willingly. This whole picture is pretty convincing. It's, it explains why the homogeneity of these events uh, that we see to date, right? The, a white dwarf uh, has a mass limit of 1.44 solar masses. So when it explodes, when it all explodes, it leads to the same amount of generation of energy. It explains why we see so many uh, intermediate mass elements in their spectra. These are silicon and uh, sulfur and uh, iron in the spectra. And uh, I don't show it here, but the detailed uh, modeling of these light curves and spectra really do uh, match uh, the observations that we see so far. But it turns out that nature could make supernovae, type 1As, in several different ways. And even though these, these details seem a little esoteric, they're actually very important. Uh, we know that the two stars probably start off somewhat similar mass, uh, just by, by the way in which uh, stars form. One gets a little advanced in its evolution than the other. Uh, and whether or not and when they do form a common envelope determines where they are prior to explosion. Uh, in one scenario, they may end up with a white dwarf and the red giant star that I was describing in the canonical picture. In another scenario, they may lead to the formation of a helium-rich donor star, which is a helium star uh, that's more massive than our red giant. Uh, and that may lead to a type 1a uh, uh, of type. These are both in the same class that we call single degenerate uh, scenarios where there's only really one white dwarf involved uh, and uh, they should lead to very similar outcomes. Um, but, uh, and then there's the third more general class of, of channels where in some way the two stars don't evolve that differently. They actually are able to both make it to the white dwarf phase and then through some merger or uh, disintegration of one or the other, uh, they're able to form a combined type 1a supernova from the combined mass. This leads, so these are, as I said, a little bit esoteric, but they have very different uh, outcomes. They have very different implications for uh, how they could affect what we see when they explode. 
But one of the big differences between those single degenerate uh, models and the double degenerate with the two white dwarfs is that uh, is the time scale it takes to get from formation to explosion, right? Uh, single degenerate uh, channels may only take a few hundred million years to get from formation to explosion. Whereas double degenerate channels could take up to the age of the universe to get from uh, their formation to explosion. And it only depends on how separated they were when they initially formed. As I said, they have a lot of implications to how robust our type 1a supernova method is. So it's highly critical to us to understand uh, which one of these in nature actually takes if uh, there is a dominant channel. So if we can begin to figure it out, then uh, that would be a, a wonderful way to begin to probe whether or not our, our method for cosmological distance measuring is robust and our method for measuring dark energy is robust. So we set up a really simple experiment. Well, we know um, uh, from detailed modeling that these things take different time scales, and those time scales are described on average, but you can actually see them as delay time distributions. And I've shown them here on log log plots, uh, where the single degenerate models they have there are a lot of different ones, but they mostly look like that family on the left. The double degenerates, because they only depend on initial separations and the radiation of angular momentum for the most part. They follow this something like a power law or an exponential decline, uh, as we see on the right. So the whole experiment is to, com is to compare the stellar birth rate to the stellar death rate, as we see as supernovae, and see if we can't nurse from those two measurements the late time distribution and maybe some information on the uh, mechanism efficiency and perhaps even the, the progenitor fraction of the IMF. So we'll start off with the thing that we think we know, the thing that we know best, and that's the stellar birth rate. <laughs> um, as I described, those really deep fields uh, with Hubble were motivated by trying to understand how galaxies evolve over time. And one of the biggest things, the biggest questions we wanted to understand, excuse me, is the rate in which um, uh, stars are formed over a cosmic scale. We can see uh, through various measurements from different experiments that the cosmic uh, birth rate or the cosmic star formation rate history is, uh, is not really all that complex, but it's not you know, one that generally just uh, grows with time. It seems to have peaked out about 10 billion years ago around the Z redshift of two, and then uh, began to slowly decline as we see it uh, to the value that we see it today. So it gradually climbed from a redshift of maybe 10 or so when the first stars formed, climbed to a redshift of uh, two, and then started to climb uh, rather rapidly in the, in the uh, recent universe. But this is a, a function that has only gotten better refined over time and still motive, you know, our uh, goal in really measuring this function as best as, po as possible is to better understand how reionization happened and how it, uh, and when eventually it turned off. So this is a pretty well-known uh, history. We have this st stellar birth rate with time. What we didn't have, at least at the time when I was really getting into this, was a history of the stellar death rate or how often supernovae happen uh, over cosmic time. Part of this is you, you look at these different rate measures. Uh, the NGSS is from my own dissertation uh, in 2003. Sloan Digital Sky Survey is those points down there. And then uh, the project which uh, we first embarked on with Hubble was called Goods. Uh, and then there are a lot of other measures you see in between. You can see that there doesn't appear to be a trend in this data at all. Is it a straight line? Is it, uh, is it increasing uh, with redshift? Is it, uh, or does it have some structure to it? It's really hard to see in the measures at that time. 
And there's a lot of reasons for that. And it largely has to do with how surveys were conducted, how we did the simple things like counted events, you know, were they all declining or, sorry, were they all in risers, meaning that you didn't see them in the previous epic and you only saw them in the current epic? Or did you also account for the events that it could, could decline in that time frame? Uh, did you account for all events, even those that may have popped off and, and disappeared in the time frame between the observations? All of these things uh, played a, a big role as to why there's a lot of dispersion in these, in these measures, at least at this, this time back in 2010. I really wanted to advance this the best I could. And as any aspiring uh, early career uh, investigator would do, they made some shortcuts. They said, okay, well, let me see. I don't understand all the details of, that went into all of these rate measures, but I understood the details that went into the two that I had a hand in. And of course, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey was very well in, in their uh, rate information. So if I just ignore all the other ones, I can actually begin to see a history of, uh, uh, you know, a bit of a uh, structure to this history. Something I can at least compare my stellar birth rate to. So for the remainder of this section, I'm going to flip this diagram. And instead of talking in terms of redshift, I'll talk in terms of age of the universe. And it'll make sense in a little bit. So if I were to get, compare what I would predict for the supernova rates from the binary synthesis models that I showed you before and overplot them on this diagram, I see some interesting trends. And the, the, some of the more interesting ones, of course, is that if you were just to assume that all type 1a supernovae were immediately plumbed, in other words, they exploded the moment that they were formed, uh, you would actually get a pretty good match to the structure of the rate history at, uh, at uh, late times of the age of the universe, or as we see it now. It just misses what, you know, the last two bins of our rate measurement. Uh, we also, we, we know that it probably isn't physical, so we can look at the single degenerate channel or the double degenerate channel, and we begin to see other similar trends, like it, it captures some of the data, but then misses other parts of the data. So the, all three of these general pictures don't seem to work very well. If we had a really simple way of trying to capture the diversity of these models through a singular uh, function, we might be able to test that function and um, pull from it in a very basic Bayesian way what models the, uh, the rate measures prefer uh, uh, by, you know, by testing, uh, by basically tuning and turning these knobs. And uh, these knobs in this case, and if you're interested, are just you know, what the mode of the distribution is, how, what its width is, and really what its uh, kurtosis looks like. And that's pretty much what we did. We, 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 we tested those models, the, the, these models, excuse me, against the supernova rate measures, comparing them to the star formation rate history that we knew before, and asked from the, that test uh, through a Monte, uh, uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo, what uh, model they best preferred. And what we found was actually a very interesting and surprising result. They actually preferred a very, very specific model that had a very, uh, had a mean time of about 3 billion years. That's what you see as, as C on the, on the X axis had a width of uh, only about a half a billion years, that's what you see as omega. And then the kurtosis, when you're talking with a very na narrowly defined uh, distribution, kind of doesn't matter. Um, what you end up with is the solid black line in the inset on the right-hand side, uh, upper right-hand side. And that looks very different from what you would expect from either the, the double degenerate or the single degenerate channel as shown in the, um, the red and the blue. What does this mean? Well, it means that if you were to take our prompt uh, example, shift it by three and a half billion years, 
And then because we don't really know the efficiency by which you know, stars become type 1a supernovae, um, we can adjust that till it gets the data. So if you assume that only 5% of white dwarfs out there become type 1As, you end up with a really good fit to all the rate data that I cherry picked uh, four slides ago. Um, that is, you know, it's wonderful because you, you begin to see something that tells you something rather interesting. It would sort of suggest that uh, the type 1As out there prefer really low mass companions uh, they may even be main sequence companions, but they seem to have a lot of tension with the standard single degenerate model. Now, as I said, I, I cherry pick data, and you know that you know you should always list your caveats uh, in your paper. That's something I learned much later in life. But uh, you should always you know list your caveats. Uh, we now know that the the rate history is actually much better measured than it ever has been before with a lot of great surveys like the dark energy survey uh des uh, um uh uh i'm gonna miss this up um snls supernova legacy survey excuse me that's the one and other greats like uh the, the uh the hawaii survey that also happened around the same time our rate history is so much better understood at least out to a redshift of one than it ever has been before. After a redshift of one, there's still a little bit of uh, uh, uncertainty, but I think we're getting closer and closer to refining that. I just recently, like last year, did a, or a year or two ago, did a reanalysis of the same um, test in a very simple, uh, the same sort of um, Markov chain Monte Carlo, and came to a slightly different answer than I did back in 2010, uh, but still found that that tension with the single degenerate, the, the standard single degenerate model is there. There's a preference for models that look more like uh, a power law or an exponential uh, delay time distribution, like I show in the inset. Uh, I should point out in this diagram that uh, the, the black points are the bend rate uh, uh, measures. They're not independent rate measures of the, of the bins of all the rate measures that you see there, assuming that they're all valid in some way. Um, and there's, uh, because of the way that I had binned it, it's actually a little hard to bin it in a way that actually agrees with, uh, let me say it differently. The, the fits are done to the rate, independent rate measures themselves, not to the bin uh, data. So there's some preference here for uh, exponential or power law delay times, which is more consistent with what you would expect from a delay from a, a double degenerate uh, model than you would from any of the single degenerate models that I showed you before. This is sort of the smoking gun. It's pretty much telling us that the vast majority of type 1a supernovae out there are probably merging white dwarfs, and they're not a canonical uh, red giant feeding a white dwarf picture that we've seen before. Supernovae are exciting for so many reasons, but I, you know, I always stick with this one uh, uh, equation because it seems to there's so many parts of it that you can nurse out by comparing. Uh, star formation rate histories to supernova rates. With core collapse events, the equation becomes simpler. There, there doesn't, we expect that massive stars have very, very short lifetimes. So for all intents and purposes, that delay time becomes negligible. We can then begin to compare other uh, parts of this diet, parts of this equation and learn about how those progenitors evolve over time. An interesting comparison is, you know, we remove that delay time distribution, as I said, it's kind of negligible. And if we assume that all massive stars explode in, as a supernova, which is a point that I'll come back to in just a little bit, we can um, begin to probe how the initial mass function makes core collapse supernova. This is actually pretty simple. If you, you know what, 
the rate is on the left hand side of the equation, uh, the supernova rate is, we know what the star formation rate is on the right hand side of the equation. K, the scaling, the fraction of the IMF that makes core collapse events, can be found in one of two ways. You can either measure it or you can calculate it. The fraction of the IMF should be pretty simple. If you know what uh, uh, the mass range is that you care about, you can just integrate from eight to 50 solar masses, assuming those are the ones that end as core collapse events. You can compare that to the formation of all stars. And it's pretty simple. It's just an integration over that range in, in green as shown on the, in, in the uh, initial mass function diagram I show on the left-hand side. You do that and you arrive at a singular value of 0.007 uh, per, per, uh, per solar mass with some errors if you have some uncertainty on, um, on what your uh, IMF model uh, looks like. But as I said, you can actually use the core collapse rates if you know them to compare and actually measure. Okay. We did that with, uh, with the survey as well. Now looking at core collapse rates out to a redshift of two and a half, much further than it ever has been before. When you bend those up, you see great agreement with the cosmic star formation rate history, as you would imagine, uh, because we said these are prompt events. Um, if you use a scaling that is 0 0.009 plus or minus 0 0.002. So this is pretty much in agreement with the expectation, the observations match the expectations. That's really, really good. You might be asking me, Lou, why are you telling me this? That you just told me something that I think we should have just pat ourselves on the back that we got the exact answer that we expected. But actually, it it begins to address a fundamental question that we have on the formation of core collapse events. One way you can look at this mystery is uh, through observations itself. We have now a wealth of Hubble high resolution, very deep images of galaxies nearby to us, nearby galaxies. And many of those have given rise to core collapse events in the history of, uh, of Hubble. We actually are able to, as a community, go back into the archive and locate uh, images of the region around uh, where a supernova originated from. In this case, this is 2012Z. Um, on the right-hand side of the inset, you can see a, the, the last residual part of the supernova in 2013. Archival images from 2005, 2006, show us exactly what that progenitor star was. You can go about measuring uh, the properties of that progenitor through these archival images and getting a sense on the mass of those uh, stars prior to explosion by comparing them to uh, the main sequence at, at that same distance. What we've stumbled upon through these sort of uh, 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 explorations, something kind of really uh, bizarre. In the uh, 20 years of doing this sort of work, we haven't located a progenitor that was more massive than roughly 20 solar masses uh, in any of these archival images. The mystery, of course, is that, as I explained earlier, we expect up to 50 solar mass stars to be exploding as core collapse supernovae. So where are the missing mass supernovae? Where are the ones that come from 20 to 50 solar masses? Well, if we were just to blindly assume that only the 20 solar mass stars, everything from 10 to or 8 to roughly 20 solar masses are responsible for the core collapses that we see, we can actually use the uh, equation which I showed earlier to calculate what that scaling would be expected to be. And we find an expectation value that's even lower as we expected, but it does not even match. It can't even come close to matching the rate of core collapse events that we see over cosmic time. So another way to say this is that there's a strong expectation for this comparison that we have 
stars that explode as supernovae from 20 to 50 solar masses. And even though we haven't yet located them in archival images, they must be going off. So we need these massive stars to explain uh, the, the core collapse rates. And as I have this question up on the upper right-hand side, do all massive stars explode? Well, at least those between 20 and, solar, and 50 solar masses must explode. Otherwise, we have this uh, big uh, discrepancy between the measurements. So I've been talking a lot about an equation and, and, and getting deep into the details. Let me go back to the observations. Uh, over time, you know, we started off doing those deep fields as I described before, but you know, as the strategies for studying galaxies change over time, so must the strategies for understanding the supernovae in piggyback programs like our own. We have to make use of uh, those new strategies to and to, to find these supernovae. And in the process, we actually are learning more and more about uh, how uh, distant supernovae and how the distant universe behave. Uh, there are a lot of surveys which I list uh, up at the top, the frontier fields, clash, relics, buffalo, some of these you may have heard of. Um, but the, the strategy now seems to be, let's look at lenses, get you know, strong lenses produced by clusters of galaxies uh, to better understand even you know, galaxies at even larger distances that are magnified by, by the natural lens of these clusters at lower redshift. Uh, we had the strange, same strategy. We could use these to study uh, supernovae at distances even further than we have been able to uh, to date. But even more, and clusters of galaxies do weird things to background galaxies. And sometimes you can actually see the same galaxy uh, lensed and distorted or, or magnified and distorted by that lens, but often distorted to the point where you get actual multiple images. So the, the ones you see here in orange uh, are, are the same galaxy. They're just three different images, actually four different images of the same galaxy as distorted by that foreground lens. What's interesting is every once in a while, you actually are able to locate a supernova that occurs in that galaxy. So you could see it multiple times uh, as well. Uh, this is just the most recent example of that, uh, of a supernova called Requiem. That is, its images are shown in that 2016 image uh, on the left-hand side. Uh, a re-examination of those, that data that was taken uh, uh, in comparison to new images that were taken in 2019 showed that those dots disappeared. They're all four, or actually all three, the ones at the lower right-hand side of the diagram, all three of them are the same supernova as seen in three different images of the same galaxy. What's more interesting is there's a circle in the upper left-hand side of the right-hand image that doesn't show a supernova. And that's actually intentional. Uh, that is a trailing image. And we believe that that image should reappear in 2037. So we've done an example like this with supernova Revsdal, which is a, another interesting uh, supernova, but uh, we can actually predict when these events should occur. And have them, uh, you know, we could basically train all eyes, train all telescopes at that reappearance and study these things in detail. Kind of cool. But as I was saying, uh, one of the biggest uh, um, motivators for studying these lenses of galaxies is that they allows, they allows us to see even further uh, out to higher redshifts than we were able to uh, through our a deep field surveys. This actually opens up the probability of space of seeing events at, you know, at the very early part of the universe and perhaps even the very first events to occur in the universe, the, those supernovae that resulted from uh, population three uh, stars. I'm motivated now, uh, again, as the field is changing, 
to start studying uh, galaxies in new ways with new instrumentation. Uh, we've seen, uh, as I said, as I showed you earlier, some amazing discoveries from uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, largely motivated by deep fields like this one. But the next telescope, which Anne Hardy said is going to, to launch in only a very short period of time, will change our perspective of what of these deep fields, revealing far more galaxies to greater depth than we've ever seen in any previous image. These things will be striking. This is just a simulation of what that, that, galaxy, that uh, deep field might look like. Another telescope which I'm really, really eager for is the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope. Uh, this is the, this is a, a, the wide field uh, infrared uh, telescope, survey telescope, which we used to call W first. It's slated to launch in uh, 2026 timeframe. Its imager will be about a half a degree uh, you know, at any given pointing, allowing us to see a hundred times larger field of view and a single pointing than either HST or JWST will ever be able to do. It's not quite as deep as JWST, but it would still be much deeper than we expect to get with, uh, with Hubble currently. The current plans as defined by the science definition teams, which I'm a part of, is to do you know, at least a five square degree field survey over a two year uh, uh, epic or two year um, cadence with at least uh, 20, getting to a, a, a magnitude, the depth of about 29 uh, magnitude, that should enable great discoveries out the hard, high redshift and begin to probe some of those questions I was talking about before. The Large Synaptic uh, Survey Telescope, which is now uh, the, the, the Rubin uh, Telescope, which I haven't updated this slide, I'm kicking myself for just now, <laughs> should also enable the discovery of tens of thousands of supernovae for cosmological studies. This will basically throw open the floodgates of, of supernova discoveries and allowing rate uh, um, investigations to higher and higher redshift than we have when we were before. We will really fill in this area of uncertainty above a redshift of one and be able to tell definitively what's happening uh, with the, uh, in comparison to star formation, et cetera. Uh, and just as one last thing to leave you with, why this, this ex excites me so much is that we can now begin to envision different types of experiments. Uh, also probing at the same equation that I was talking about before. We can now throw in even ma more massive stars, uh, the, the supernovae from even more massive stars, from up to 100 solar masses or to 200 solar masses, these super luminous supernovae, and maybe even population three star supernovae. Uh, and we can begin to probe how the IMF is changing over time. Uh, with more and more precise rates and higher and higher redshift, we might be able to see that the IMF is actually not uh, um, the same as it is now in the local universe. The experiment is pretty simple in, in general, in essence, if the IMF is getting more and more steep, more and more top heavy over time, the rate of core collapse events should increase, increase with time. And you know, we'll be able to, to, to say something about um, through that measure of core collapse or the increased number of core collapse events, uh, what the evolving IMF is actually doing. And this plot actually just shows you, uh, you know, why these telescopes like Roman will be so much better at this than any other survey that we've done to date. It's just going to have so much better signal and gathering events and being able to distinguish that between uh, these different models at a higher, um, to a higher signal noise and out to higher redshifts than has ever been done before. And lastly, I'll leave you, I, I these are all 
far distant supernovae. I promised you some nearby supernova. And this is my uh, favorite pr project that um, a grad student at FIT has picked up, uh, from Florida Institute of Technology has picked up for me. And um, uh, um, this is open response time. So this is an image of a supernova. Um, in the inset, you can actually see the field around the supernova and the, uh, sorry, the, the outset, you can see the, the field around the supernova. The insets show the supernova itself as it was uh, in March of 1999. Then again, the field prior to March of 1999, February of 1999, and the difference between those reveals the supernova itself. I can tell you through detailed spectra that this is indeed a type 1a supernova. It's a pretty uh, interesting one for many reasons, but it is a type 1a supernova. Here's the quiz. What's missing in this image? And because I can't see you all, I won't do a show of hands. I'll just ask you to shout it out. There's no galaxy? There is no galaxy. Thank you. If I had anything to give you, I'll give you a virtual cookie. How's that? Uh, thank you. There is no host galaxy. We've seen a few images of supernovae in my, in my talk. And in each one of them, there's this large uh, galaxy with you know, structure and so on, but there doesn't appear to be a galaxy in this image. In fact, we had to go back with uh, the then brand new uh, Magellan, uh, the body um, six and a half meter telescope, take a very, very deep image uh, to actually reveal that dwarf host galaxy. So this led to a rather interesting question. How many hostless supernovae out, are out there? And what can they tell us about the formation of ultra faint galaxies that are in the field? not in clusters of galaxies. This is a pretty interesting test. It would reveal what's happening with the lower end of the, the, the Schechter function or the, uh, the basically the, the density, uh, pr the number density of galaxies of different magnitudes out there. And it can be done in a rather simple way. You just measure the rate of these very uh, of these hostless supernovae, go back and try to recover those hosts, the magnitudes of those hosts, and make a plot of the rate per unit magnitude of the host, and compare that to the expectation number of host galaxies that you would get from uh, predictions of Lambda CDF. My uh, grad student has painstakingly gone through the archive of these events, trying to locate their host galaxies and make a measure and put it on these, this diagram. He's inching ever closer to graduating. And I'm hoping it will happen very, very soon. <laughs> but uh, I, I, it'll be pretty revealing. I think you'll be able to see that, uh, make some uh, prediction of what the low end slope is doing for the Schechter function. And with that, I'm going to say uh, just my summary that you know supernovae are telling us wonderful things about constraining dark energy and the evolution of uh, dark energy, and we're going to get that with JWST and W first in this next in this wonderful decade to come. But along the way, these rates are also going to the rates of these events are also going to tell us wonderful things about regenerator mechanisms, independent measures of star formation history and the, the, the constraints on the, the progenitors of core collapse events. And uh, those are the mug shots of my co-conspirators to date. And with that, I'll take some questions. And maybe what, what's the best way to do this? Uh, should I stop sharing in case, or what should I do? I'll stop sharing. Any questions? I have quite a few, but I'm going to the students. Ask questions kind of. Yes, Kayla, do you personally have any projects that are in telescopes that are launching? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? It was a little hard for me to hear. Do you personally have any projects with any telescopes that are launching or not? 
Uh, not yet. <laughs> so, and that, that's okay. Um, so James Webb only has had one call for proposals. We put in a uh, proposal that was very, very ambitious. And uh, our colleagues said, let's wait and see if the telescope actually works before we do this. Uh, so I think that that's reasonable. We'll come back in the next cycle with a much more ambitious program than we did for cycle one. We'll see what happens. But at the moment, no. I'm, uh, we, uh, James Webb uh, is, is going to launch very shortly. We're going to start the commissioning phase uh, here uh, in the next in the six months that follow after launch. And uh, those observations are expected to begin sometime in the June to July timeframe. Um, and then you know, the next cycle will be in, in 2023. Roman is not going to launch uh, until 2026 20, in its current time frame. So we still have lots of time to prepare for that for that uh, that telescope. I'm going to ask my question, if you don't mind. I'm not in the realm, I'm not in the close uh, circle of supernova, right? And you talked about like that uh, puzzle why we don't we for the progenitor of supernova we only see red stars. That, like in, and when we go in the archives, we only see red stars producing supernova. I've heard that uh, a, a proposition, like a, a, a hypothesis, that these uh, stars that, that could be bigger may, might not actually explode in supernova. That, that could be something else. Do you have something to say about that? Very good point. In fact, there was um, a discovery not too long ago of a star, a supernova, no, excuse me, a star in a deep field that just disappeared. There was no recorded supernova that went along with it. There were certain, uh, certainly ample opportunities for a supernova to be discovered, but the star itself was there in one image and then gone to the next. And we're, I think it's, it was a very massive star, yes. Um, so that has led to the hypothesis and there are others through uh, rather detailed modeling would suggest that there may be a mass range in that uh, 20 to 50 solar mass uh, total range that may lead to the onset of the formation of black holes rather than stellar explosions. So my response to that is that the, the, core, the core collapse rate measurements are made off of supernovae, not off of black holes. So if, uh, if a large number of those massive stars were to form black holes, we would see, we would observe the core collapse rates being shorter than expected for star formation. Um, and we don't, right? We see it as being higher, much higher than, than, than that. So the rates suggest that there, these are exploding as massive, these massive stars are exploding as supernovae. Um, why we don't see them is a bit of a mystery. Now, the other part of it, of course, is that they're massive stars, and massive stars happen in regions of star formation, which are also dust and shrouded. So it's not entirely impossible that those stars themselves are just not visible to us. Uh, they, when they, before they explode, they're just too uh, dust and shrouded to actually be revealed. Um, I haven't really talked to those investigators to, to ask uh, more thoroughly how many of these you know, did you go hunting for and you suspect are just too dim to be seen? Um, but there are a number that they go hunting for and they don't recover. Any other questions? Dr. Steinhauer. Oh, Dr. Steinhauer has a question. Go ahead. Thanks, Lou. Uh, fantastic talk, really interesting stuff. Um, I'm a little bit out of this field and, and I was surprised to hear you say that we think now that most type 1As are white dwarf mergers. Is that true? Yeah. And, and if so, and if so, what what is the mechanism for the luminosities all being about the same? Because then the masses could be anything, right? Yeah, they can be. And that's, that's part of the fun thing. <laughs> so, uh, you know, more often than not, we retort by saying, ah, this is actually explaining the, the heterogeneity we see, right? They have a range of luminosities, even though it's a very narrow range. Two magnitudes is a lot, actually. <laughs> uh, so 
you might say that it's just the difference in masses uh, of white dwarf, white dwarf mergers you, uh, that we're seeing there. Um, but again, it, it, you know, you have uh, e each white dwarf itself can't get over uh, 1.4 solar masses. So the combined masses can't get over three solar masses of, of material. Um, so you would expect there are some tensions there. I think the, in the end, there are some tensions, but the, there are a lot of other great observations that actually show that really point more to double degenerate events than single degenerate events. I should say the biggest caveat in all this is we're not saying that nature only takes double degenerate channels to make them type one or C finale. Just the vast majority take double degenerate channels. There are examples of those that we actually firmly believe or single degenerate type one or supernova. Okay, one, one other question. Um, you talked about the possibility of observing type pop three stars going supernova directly, which which blew my mind. Yeah. Uh, how, how far, for, for actually most people in the audience probably don't even know what pop three stars are. They're the first generation of stars that don't have any heavy, just basically hydrogen and helium. How far, Redshift, do you think you have to go to see a pop three supernova? That's an excellent question. And the answer is as far as it takes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there, the biggest, I think the, the one thing that we want to answer with this type of investigation is when the, the when was the last epic of population three, super, or when was the epic, I should say, a population three supernovae or population three stars. Uh, we don't see metal uh, free stars in the current universe. And that's the, uh, the big conundrum. We think we should see them, but we don't. I mean, we certainly don't see the supernovae or we haven't recognized them from what, they, what they're for. We do believe that some, as you go further and further back, you're getting less and less metal enriched on, on average. And you know, if you see a supernova at Z of 12, it's pretty likely that it didn't have any, uh, any uh, enrichment to begin with. So that's the, the game that we're gonna be playing. I think is the first initial discovery comes along and shows us that it's probably definitively metal free, uh, then that will be a wonderful discovery in itself. And then as we build up that population, we'll be able to say what's going on. Cool, thanks. No problem. Any other questions for me? Yes. Do we expect a supernova explosion in the Milky Way anytime soon? I've heard oh. that there are kind of periodic explosions. Or... That's my favorite question. Um, <laughs> Okay, so the rate of, I'll give you the answer and I, uh, I'll give you the question and I expect you to answer. <laughs> the rate of supernovae as measured in galaxies similar to our own for core collapse events is one every 100 years or so. For type 1a supernovae, it's one every 500 years or so. When was the last supernova we observed in our own galaxy? Couldn't tell you. Couldn't tell you. I'll tell you that uh, the last one that we've observed was, uh, I think it was Kepler's supernova. I can never remember whether that was Tycho Brahe supernova or Kepler supernova, but they're right on top of each other. 1604 was the last observed supernova in our uh, galaxy. There's a remnant that may have been, uh, may have exploded in the 1700s. And it looks like it's a core collapse event. But for core collapse events, we are probably 200 to 300 years late for an, uh, an event. And for 1As, we're about due. So uh, eyes on the skies, people. Look for your supernova. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, uh, just kind of follow up on that. Uh, I know, uh, like, what would, like, in the sky, what would that kind of look like? Oh, um, so for, for Tycho Brahe and, and, um, and Kepler, they had the benefit of Galileo's discovery, the telescope. 
to really push and study the sky. Those supernovae didn't need a lot of help, though. They, were, they would have been visible by the naked eye. They weren't very, very bright, but they would have been visible. The last one which everyone could have seen was probably 1054. And that was the event that led to the Crab Nebula that we see now. It's recorded by you know, all sorts of ordinary folks, uh, mostly in, in China and, and uh, parts, uh, and sorry, in Asian countries. Uh, most of the Western uh, world didn't observe it, which is kind of ironic and weird. Maybe it's because we were too busy worrying to actually look up. But um, the, the bottom line is that when they do have happened, and we expect one will happen soon, uh, depending on how close by it is, we'll either see it as a, a really new star that can be visible during the day for you know, several days to two months on time, or at night we'll see it as a new star. Or if it's super close, uh, we won't see it very, we'll see it very shortly and then we won't see anything for a while. Um, but hopefully it won't be that close. There are no nearby stars that I imagine are going to go supernova. The, the next, the, the most logical next likely supernova will be uh, a star in the southern in the, in the southern hemisphere called Eta Carina, uh, and that is a very very luminous, very very massive star. Uh, some estimates place it well over a hundred solar masses, but uh, it is constantly behaving like it's going to explode. Uh, and I'll, just to add to this story, last year we had a bit of a startle where Betelgeuse, which is one of the bright stars in Orion, started to act like a star that might explode. It turned out that it's, it wasn't that close to explosion, but it was, uh, it was, it was acting like it. Um, so, you know, bets are on. Any hope of seeing a wolf riot become supernova? We have never seen that, I think. No, I don't think a wolf ray. Um, so I'm not entirely sure what class of star you, I mean, I guess Eta Carina is a luminous blue variable. Um, it's not really a wolf ray. Um, um, those are the ones that we would expect to happen too. I don't know of any offhand that are, uh, you know, due to go, um, but you know, we, there's so much about stellar evolution, especially in the very late stages, that we just don't understand because we haven't observed it during this period of enlightenment that we have. So. They're too rare and too crazy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Let's thank our speaker, Lou. Thank you for inviting me. This was wonderful. Us. Uh, this is uh, really nice to have you, uh, especially that uh, Zoom helps, but at the same time, it would be great to now have you for, the, for dinner with us, but that's not going to happen, <laughs> sadly. But we are very uh, grateful that you've been here, and best of luck with uh, the launch of James Webb. <laughs> it was my pleasure. Thank you again. Thank you very much.